All right, hello everyone. My name's Max Hurd. You can't really see it. It says so just there. Okay. Welcome to my seminar. I'm very impressed that you want to see me rather than Bill Booth, because after all, well, who's Bill Booth, eh? A couple of familiar faces here who are speeders. Um, the rest of you, why are you here? Just curious or keen on doing a bit of speed, maybe? Or yeah, have tried it and failed miserably and don't have a clue how to do anything? Yeah? Cool. So what I'm going to do, oh, sorry, there's varying volumes depending on what I'm doing. And there is an annoying buzz in the background, but I'm not sure we can get rid of that. So I think we're just going to have to bear with it. OK, who am I? This is me, 25 years skydiving, a lot of tandems, but actually less than 250 speed skydives, dedicated skydives to going fast. Um, last year, uh, some championships, some wins, some gold, some silver and the British speed record, 559.78 kilometers per hour. That's 348 point something miles per hour. And that, as you'll find out when we talk about this, is the average over the vertical kilometer, the measuring zone, okay? So it's getting pretty fast there. That uh, measuring zone goes, goes quite quickly. Vertical kilometer goes in about five and a half seconds when you're going that fast. So it's kind of fun going fast when it all happens, okay? picture there to massage my ego because uh, I am winning medals but the reason I put this up is more to say you don't have to be big and fat to do this okay two guys next to me there's Mikey and there's Matt okay Bro silver and bronze hello silver and bronze okay they're both much much bigger than me okay and I'm beating them for the time being anyway I weigh 80 kilos these guys are weighing 95, 90, 95, 100. Yeah, up, up, a bit more, a bit more, a bit more. Okay, you don't have to be big and fat to do this. Okay, so everybody that believes it's all about eating pies, it's not like that. Okay, you can learn how to go, do it and go fast without the pies. Okay, so this is what we're going to be quickly covering this afternoon. I've got about 30 odd si slides, so it's a fairly whistle stop tour through things. So I'm going to give a broad outline. I'm not going to get too bogged down on the technicalities of the rules and things, things and bits and pieces like that, okay? But a broad outline of how speed skydiving works. A technical explanation of some of the techniques I use, and also some secret stuff, a bit of the soft stuff, as they say in management. So kit, a tight rig. This is really, really important. I know it's blindingly obvious, but it's really, really important. We've had some difficulties with magnetic riser covers, for instance, okay? But we're overcoming those by making sure the risers are packed tightly and also by ensuring that, sorry, I'm trying not to let things slide off, uh, also ensuring that double magnets and things like that to keep everything tight. I personally have an older javelin with tuck tabs and it stayed nice and tight. Okay, obviously a tight closing loop, um, and you also want to have a tight pilot chute pouch as well. Okay, easy job for a rigger to do, put another one on that's tighter and more snug, or even just a couple of stitches in the opening in the mouth of it to keep it tight. Okay, obviously not so tight that you can't get your pilot chute out, that kind of negates the, uh, the whole issue. Um, also, we're kind of moving away from hackies as well. Hackies are big and heavy and they bounce around and they can catch air, particularly in the turbulence if you go unstable. And you will go unstable at some point or another as you're learning how to do speed skydiving. Okay. So we're very keen on tight pilot chutes with a pud on the pilot chute. Those of you who are old enough, remember pullouts. Pullouts work for this kind of stuff in the same way they did to previous stuff. Okay. So nice tight rig. Okay. Gimp suits are out. They're really hard to fly, and as I'll explain, you don't get much feedback, okay? Baggy pants with a tight top were pretty cheap in terms of jumpsuits. Most people are wearing a pair of jeans, okay? A pair of jeans and compression tops. I buy my compression tops from uh, Sports Direct because they're cheap, and you rag through a couple in a season. But you know, nice, tight upper body and some baggy, bagginess <coughs> on the legs. Two audibles is really, really important. It's mandatory for uh, competition rules and stuff anyway, but it gets loud, even with a nice snug helmet, okay? Having two audibles so that if a one does, doesn't read right or you can't hear one or you're, you have an equalized in one ear, 
you can still hear an audible. I personally have, have spent the money on getting LED outputs for my audibles, my uh, Protract, uh, no, my Optimus LED outputs, and I've got an LED in front of each eye, okay? Which means I've given up listening out for beeps. I just get flashes in front of my eyes, okay, that tell me when I need to know things. But definitely two audibles. You can do it with a full face helmet, but it's kind of hard. It's really, really noisy, okay, particularly when you start going fast. Slow opening canopy is always good, and we have slow opening canopies nowadays anyway, okay? But yeah, you don't want to be thinking about how your opening is going to be as you're in the skydive. You want to be focusing on the skydive, not worrying about whether you're going to get something that's going to crack your back when you open, okay? And SMDs, speed measuring devices. Uh, the official ones are last number of scar pro tracks, okay? In competition, you wear two, and as I'll show you with the data, it's all about taking the average of the two during the speed skydive, during the measuring zone, okay? But if you've got one, that's fine for downloading the data and having a look, okay? And also, some people are using um, fly sites. Fly sites are getting quite common nowadays, okay? It is possible to set the... Um, set the settings on them to accommodate going fast vertically rather than the wingsuit traditional use of a fly site. Okay. They work slightly differently because they're working on a GPS signal. The SMDs that we use in measure airspeed. They they're barometric devices measuring pressure change. And this is how we're measuring all our speeds in speed skydiving. It's airspeed, not speed from your vertical position to the ground. It's airspeed. Does that make sense? Cool, cool. Where we wear the Protrax is either side of the rig, on, either on the laterals or on the rig itself, in line with your hips, okay, the upper part of your uh, iliac crest, your hip bones, in line with there, okay. And the reason you have two is it's very easy to have a high pressure or a low pressure zone. And if your Protrax is in the high pressure zone, you're going to get a really good reading. And if it's in a low pressure zone, you're going to get a completely different reading. Okay. So you have two Protrax and they average out. That gives you your speed in competition. And we'll cover the data in a minute. So how does it work? Exit altitude, 4,000 meters, 13,000 feet. Okay. And how do we do an exit order? There's different calls on this. Some places like the speeders to go first, okay, because you're down fast and you're not overtaking anybody. But then on the other hand, with proper separation, it shouldn't matter that you're overtaking anybody. And some places prefer you to go out last, okay. Depends on the drop zone. It also depends on the speeders that you're jumping with, stuff like that. These things are up for discussion when you're doing speed jumps with other people. Um, in um, competition, for, for instance, for separation, we have a maximum of six out on a pass now. Five. It used to be eight. Out for, it used to be eight on a pass, and now it's six. So one pass is six individual speeders out. So it's a fairly light kind of pass, okay? But you need the separation, okay? Obviously, you're doing this solo, so you're not interfering with anybody else. So you get a separation according to the wind, uh, wind speed up at altitude of your usual separation that it would be between groups of, say, free flyers or something like that. Five, six, seven, eight seconds, whatever it may be. So you've got reasonable separation in free fall. Solo exit and the transition from your solo exit into a dive. Okay? Some people do it head up. Okay? There's a limitation to speed head up. We just can't get past it. No matter how good people are in their head-up position, they're never going to get much past 350 kilometers an hour. Okay? So the secret is the dive. Okay? Where this stands, I believe you just need your basic level free flow, which is FF1, to be able to do this, to be signed off by your DZO, uh, to be able to go speed skydiving. Okay? And we do a... Hold on, I have remember. I've got a line now. 90 degree off line of flight. Okay. The reason we do this is your movement in a speed skydive is not going to be laterally. It's not going to be left to right. It's going to be forward or backwards. Now, if you go out and dive down flight line and you don't have a steep dive, you're going to be effectively tracking up flight line. Okay. So 
Conversely, if you over-rotate and you're on your back, you're going to be tracking backwards down flight line, interfering with whoever's in front or behind you. So we arrange between the speeders in the group which way they're going to turn. So you're going to get out, you're going to go into your dive, and then you're going to make your turn. 90 degrees, it has to be 90 degrees from flight line. That then means that one person turns left, one person turns right, one left, one right. So if you have any movement, forward or back, you might end up as the same side as the person who's gone out before you, but you're not going to be underneath them. Okay? You're not going up and down flight line underneath somebody. You're going to be getting out, turning left, and if there's any kind of movement, it's going to be cross the flight line. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay. Speed. Speed measuring zone. Vertical kilometer, 2,700 meters to 1,700 meters. Okay? Some people prefer to have just one warning on their audibles to exit. That's their break-off height. Okay, I personally have two, so I know when I'm going into the imaginary marking gates, the entry gates, and the exit. Okay, so it's up to you what you do. Some people just like to get out and accelerate and accelerate and accelerate until they get their beeps that tell them to exit and slow down. Sorry, to tell them to um, slow down. They're exiting the speed zone. Okay, I prefer to. Okay. Also, it's helpful to have a visual reference on the ground, but we'll come to this in a bit. Break off after exiting lower gate, track forward and slow down. Okay. So again, that's going to take you a little bit further off flight line, left or right, whichever way you're going. <coughs> okay. But you should be in a position to make it back. Very rarely do speeders end up landing off. What's really important is awareness of everybody else. Okay, you're overtaking people. You know, if, for instance, you're going out last, you're going to be open before the group before you if they're belly flying or if they're free flying. So it's up to you to make sure you don't start heading back to the landing area until they're open. So knowing who's ahead of you, who's behind you is really important. Because once you open, you need to stay pretty much in the same area until they're open around you, and then you're in a safe position to do it. Okay, nice safe canopy ride and then download the data and try and make sense of what happened. This is one of the entertaining things about the job is, well the jump, is that your feedback is not real time. You can't look at the video straight away and have somebody say, oh yeah, you've got 10 points. They've just got to be downloaded and made into one of these graphs. Okay, that is the most awesome graph in the history of the speed skydiving world. That's Henrik Reimer, world uh, champion in 2016, and world record 601 kilometers an hour. That's his average over the uh, vertical kilometer. Now, to make this, this, mind that. This looks a little bit odd and a little bit confusing, but it's actually really simple. I'll explain this. You've got your altitude here, and you've got your time going along here, and you've got your speed on that side. Okay, the blue line is your altitude. So you get out just above 4,000 meters here, descending, 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 and at 2,700 meters, he enters the speed measuring zone and exit the speed measuring zone at 1,700 meters. Okay? Now, this is his speed. As he's descending, his speed is increasing. So this box, this bar here, is effectively being able to take that 1,000, sorry, 2,700 to 1,700 putting it upright and saying this is the measuring zone from there to there. Okay, So that's the speed zone. So there he is, accelerating, accelerate. He actually exits, he actually starts slowing down before he's even exited the speed zone. Okay, So he could have gone even faster. Okay, So that's our speed on the side here. And we've got some numbers up here. And this is the download, this is the average. You've got 613 Ks on one. 588 Ks on the other. They'll never or very rarely read exactly the same. Okay, So you take an average of the two. If they are too divergent, you'll get a penalty. And if they're way too divergent, it's a no jump. Because you'll see in one of my later graphs, if they're too far apart, you don't know which is the real speed. They're just too far apart. Okay. So what we've got here, also, you can see there's kind of three lines going on here. You've got a central red line, that's your average, and then you've got these two other lines here and there that occasionally appear, 
Okay, that's the line from one pro track on one side and one pro track on the other side. Okay, and this is where you can see there's a little bit of instability as he's settling into it, a little bit of a wobble, settles a little bit of a wobble, and then once he's in the zone, he's just super smooth and super clean. Everybody happy with that? Cool, Leo, do exits. All right, this is how I go fast. These are the things that I've kind of worked out, things I've been told, things I've worked out for myself that make sense, that have worked for me. Okay, so horizontal with head into the relative wind. Okay, if you exit in an FS styly with your chest the relative wind, your head up, and you're losing the speed that the aircraft has given you as you drift back with the wind. You need to be head into the wind. Who here free flies? Okay, you've all seen free flies exiting the plane. They go ready, set, go, and drop head into the relative wind. That's what you're going to be doing. Okay. And you want to avoid lateral drift. If you launch out of the aircraft, head into wind, and go scooting across the sky, you've got a whole bunch of lateral energy that you're going to have to stop before you can then settle into that dive towards the planet. So one of the secrets is, is just dropping out of the door, head into the relative wind. Like this guy here. There's the edge of the door. He hasn't gone far from the doorway. He's just in the door. I don't know, um, I didn't actually take this photograph, so I don't know whether he's standing or sitting or kneeling or squatting, but he's just hopped out. He's got his head directly into the relative wind. He's got a stable position, and he hasn't gone far from the door. This guy here, I've used this picture slightly cheekily because this is Moritz. He's World Cup and the European Cup winner last year, and he does something different, but it's a good illustration of lateral momentum that's taken him away from the flight line. Okay. So that's what kind of what you want to avoid. You want to be able to just drop out, head into the relative wind, fall. And you start to feel the wind and how you go into the dive, which we'll come into in a minute. Set up the door to facilitate this. How you exit is kind of up to you. I do a little kind of squatting thing. Some people stand, some people get out on the rail. It's whatever works for you that enables you to make that nice, clean drop into the airflow. Okay? And one of the important things is do the same exit every time. Find the exit that works for you, and then just repeat it, because that's one less thing you have to think about. Because the skydive gets pretty busy once it starts getting fast. Okay? So do the same thing every time. Find what works for you. So we're now in the acceleration phase. You need to breathe and relax. I have an exit routine where I take a deep breath before exit and as I drop out into the airflow I just exhale. Do a little bit of a shake and go and then I'm into the acceleration phase. Stable body position, you know, going back to that man, leg spread. Okay, there's a lovely picture here of Mikey Lovemore. That's a lovely stable body position for speed. Okay. As it gets faster, he's going to slim that down. But right now, as he's dropping into the vertical, that's a perfect position, almost like a badminton shuttlecock. You've got that drag on your lower body, your legs slightly spread, but not much drag on the upper body. And what's going to happen is you're going to do a roll forward into the dive. Okay. Mike described it to me when I first started doing it as rolling off the beach ball. Okay. Initially, the relative wind is straight into your head. Okay, and as you fall forward, that relative wind that was originally from the travel of the plane is coming from the deck. So you're going to roll into that dive. Okay, don't push yourself into the dive. We found that's pretty counterproductive because when you push yourself into the dive, the relative wind is no longer on your head. You then start feeling it on your back, and you're not quite sure where you are in that airflow. Okay, so think about it as just following that airflow in your head, or on the top of your head, into the dive, rolling off the, the big beach ball. And there's a lovely sensation of you're in the air, head into the relative wind, and you tilt forward, and you just roll it, roll it, and then it goes, boom, and you just drop straight down. So imagine yourself lying on a massive beach ball the size of this room, and just rolling it forward until you go, and drop into the dive. Don't push it. Here's a bit of video. Okay. Um, 
Unfortunately, we're pretty thin on the ground for awesome video at speed skydivers, but this gives you a little bit of an idea of the exit and the roll into the dive. Just dropping straight off, stable body position. Here I'm rolling into the dive, and that's where it starts accelerating. Anybody want to see that again? Or does that make sense? It's one question. Where are you actually turning off? Or how? We're going to come to the. Okay. Because that's when you make your turn. Don't make your turn until you're into that dive. Because if you are at an angle, you're following the air, and then you make the turn, you can end up diving like this. And that'll give different pressures on each side of your body, which is going to cause massive divergence in what your protracts are reading, which means your jump will be disallowed because they're too far apart. Okay? I've got a lovely bit of um, a graph somewhere where you can just see it right from the very beginning, the whole graph is absolutely smooth, but the two protracts just do this. You know, one's going really fast, one's going really slow, because I'm falling on my side. One side's got a high pressure, one side's got a low pressure. It's perfectly smooth and clean. It's a really smooth, clean, lovely jump, but it's just disallowable because the protracts went so far apart. Okay? So you make that turn when you're in the dive. Wait until you're into that steep dive. Okay? And then the speed, speed zone. You want to be steep, but not too steep, okay? So you need an aiming point. Some people will aim, at their, vo um, their visual focus is on the horizon, okay? I find it much, much better to have a visual focus on the ground, and you want to be in a steep dive, a really, really steep dive, okay? So you're not absolutely vertical. If you're absolutely vertical, it's hard to kind of maintain that stability because where's your air? that gives you stability? Is it on your belly or is it on your back? And that's when you can start vibrating and wobbling, okay? So you think about your angle of attack. You want it to be a really, really, really steep dive, but not absolutely vertical. And you're feeling your feedback. That's coming from your legs, okay? You're getting it from your knees down where your jeans are a little bit baggy and they're flapping around your ankles. People say, oh, I feel the wind on my chest. I've never been able to. And wind on your back, you've got a rig on your back. How do you know when the wind's on your back? But I can feel whether my jeans are pushing backwards or pushing forwards. Okay, where's the wind? Is it on the back of my legs or the front of my legs? Am I on in a steep dive or have I over-rotated? Now, if you over-rotate, this happens. I've got lovely acceleration. This is one of mine. Lovely acceleration, lovely acceleration. And at this point here, I over-rotate. I go onto my back. And what happens is you get a massive slowing down. Now, nobody really knows why, but when you do that over-rotation past the vertical onto your back, you never go a little bit on your back. You go a big bit on your back. It doesn't necessarily feel like that, but you get a huge slowing down. So you get this double hump. This is me going accelerating, accelerating, over-rotate the dive, and I'm on my back, and then I push it back to vertical or... Uh, less than vertical, a really steep dive, and then I accelerate. But I'm already heading out of the speed zone by then. Okay? So the secret is that steep dive. Quite often, when you're learning how to do this, that's where um, your bad jumps come from. You can see it go, accelerate, and then you'll get a double hump as you over-rotate and then push it back into the vertical, or call it to the steep dive. Okay. And then you're going to be slimming it down. You remember we talked about Mikey's position, how he's nice and stable. That stability <coughs> is coming from his legs. But as he goes faster, he wants to be reducing that. So you're going faster and faster and faster and faster. So you need to be slimming down your body position. Some people talk about a feeling of stretching themselves, of pushing themselves so that they're longer. I think about that. I also think about kind of keeping things in. Okay, so you want to slim down your body position and breathe and relax. I know it's really easy to say because it's this weird thing of you've got a really fast, very noisy, and very kind of, there's lots of vibration and shaking going on, but in amongst that you're just really going and relax. And it's a kind of special kind of relaxation, okay? James Parker, though he was taking the mickey, 
uh, when we were talking about that feeling, he said in a um, Mr. Miyagi way, strong like water. And we all laughed and went, well, actually, that's kind of right. You need to have a core strength and a core uh, stability, but you need to be able to ride the ripples in the air because the air is not smooth. Okay? There will be ripples, there will be vibrations. Okay? If you're stiff, you then start bouncing off those ripples. So it's finding that balance between being firm and having that core strength, but also being able to ride the little instabilities. That's my body position in free fall. That's what I think my body position is in free fall, because I've never really had anybody video me when I've been a fast dive. So this is what I'm trying to do, and then I lay down and got somebody to take photos of me. Okay. But that's what we're aiming to do. If I want to go faster, I'm going to be reducing the distance, the gap between my legs. Okay. I know I look slightly not need like that. Maybe I am. I don't know. Okay, and you see that slight angle, that very steep dive. Not absolutely vertical, but very steep dive. That's where the wind is hitting me there. Okay. I feel like I should be in a pub with a pint leaning against the bar like this. Okay, I'll have to do that afterwards. Cool. And then tracking out. This is another really interesting thing that we found with speed skydiving. Okay, the way the... Um, Arsene Bruscard software works is there's just so much slight variations in your graph, in the inputs, you'd end up with a really jaggedy graph that would be hard to read. So it smooths it out. It does four calculations a second, four um, data points per second, but it smooths those out over the previous four seconds. So it averages them out, so you've got a smoother graph. Because your graph isn't the exact representation. What matters is the actual average of the numbers. But the graph gives you a good representation of the skydive that you were doing, but it's a smoothed version. And what can happen, because if you have interference on your SMDs, you can have a massive divergence as you exit the gate. But because this is averaged out over the previous four seconds, it can interfere with your average within the game. Okay. Does that make sense? As I've exited the gate at this point here, I've leveled out and I've caused interference on my speed measuring devices by having my arms close to my sides or by not being absolutely smooth with my break off. And they've diverged. Okay. But because it's averaged back over four seconds, it's affected my whole skydive. Okay? So here I am, I'm going, I get a big wobble here, but I got a grip of it and got it back and was really smooth because I remember the skydive really smooth all the way through to the exit point there, the exit of the gates, and then I broke off, tracked out. But as I did so, I caused this massive interference. And this is an out of bounds jump. One was reading 630 Ks, which was awesome. And I was really pleased when I saw that. And the other one was reading 528, 100 kilometers apart, OK? <coughs> Too far apart to read, you just can't do that, OK? You're just not going to get a result from that. So it's an out of bounds jump. So this is one of the important things. When you're doing competition stuff, how you break off is really, really important to reduce that um, interference on the break-off. If I'd done a smooth break-off, that would have been a smooth peak at the top and it would have been an inbounds jump. I don't know. I think I was trying, bizarrely, in competition. Why would I try something new in competition but I was trying a new hand arm position on break-off? I know, schoolboy era. You know. But yeah, I was, I was... When I looked at one of the pro tracks as I landed and it the peak speed was like 650 or something. I was like, happy with that. And then when I looked at the other one, I was like, yeah, maybe not. Okay. Does that make sense about the fact that you've got to have a smooth break off to make sure you don't cause interference that gets data averaged back into your, your overall average? Okay. Don't take it low. Please don't take it low. We've had a couple of people on road shows who haven't heard their protract going, or their audible going off. And they're going, haven't heard it go off yet. Maybe it should be going off soon. I really ought to. No, no, no. If you haven't heard it and you think you ought to have done, come out of it. 
it's much better to hear it going off, going, damn, I slowed down too early, than to be barreling through 2,000 feet at 300 odd miles an hour. Okay? Not a good situation to be in. So, this is the other reason to have a good visual reference on the ground. You know when the planet's getting big in your field of vision. Okay? If you have any doubt of where you are, slow it down. And again, and I can't emphasize this enough, be aware of other jumpers. Know where everybody is, know how many of them there are in the group before you, the group behind you, so you can identify them and go, okay, I'm now safe to move from my opening point. Now, secret stuff. This is the soft stuff. This is the bits that I've worked out that help me get faster and get better. Chilling in the plane is really, really important for me. Okay. I've actually got speakers in my helmet and uh, what's the name? A iPod shuffle just sewn into the material on the back. And you just see me. People are talking to me and everything, but I've got a dark visor and I'm just listening to my music. Okay. Getting into the right zone. It's really important with any type of skydiving, any competition, in fact. Relaxation is really, really important. But I think particularly so with speed skydiving. It's a very busy, very intense jump and it's very inward. Everything else in skydiving will work in towards other people. You know, the cameraman, your, uh, what's the name, your teammates, the four-way, the eight-way, the reference points. In speed skydiving, a lot of it is internal, okay? Your feel, your reactions, your understanding of what's going on, okay? So the clearer the mind you have, the smoother and sweeter your jump's gonna be, okay? And during the jump, feel the air, Breathe, relax, breathe, breathe, breathe. And not breathing fast. I have a tendency to get out of the plane and if they have just going fast, I'm going <laughs> you know. So telling, telling myself to go and keep everything smooth. Safe canopy rights are really, really important. It, like I said, it's a busy skydive. If you have some scary stuff happening after opening, some interference with other jumpers, or you have a hardcore suite that went a little bit wrong and scared the hell out of you, it's going to impact on your next jump, okay? You're not going to be happy getting in that plane because of something that's happened on the jump before. So keep it safe in the canopy ride, and the results, particularly in competition, this is part of the game. You've got to delay 20 minutes, half an hour maybe, before you know the results, okay? And that's quite a difficult process to go through. And we don't know sometimes. Sometimes we can be wildly out. We can walk off the landing area going, that was rubbish, and have a really good result. But you can also walk off the landing area going, yeah, that was <laughs> No. OK. So you don't know. So there's an element of staying calm, reserving your judgment until the numbers come through. But the other thing is, is when you get the results, try and correlate them to what you did before, okay? Try and remember how that skydive went. It's worth, as you're walking off the landing area, I tend to be fairly mute walking off the landing area because I'm just running through that skydive in my head. So I went, okay, this happened, that's happened, it got a bit wobbly here, but I think it was all right just as I entered the zone, etc. okay? It's worth logging that in so that when you see the results, you've got a bit of a memory of how that jump went. Visualization. Who does competition skydiving here anyway, of any kind? A bit sky, okay. Visualization, really, really important skydiving. And it's not just for FS and point scoring and set routines. Visualizing that skydive that you're going to do is really important. Um, I've read a book by Dr. John de Rosalia, Skydiving, Mental Training for Skydiving and Life. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. Um, 15, 20 quid. Lots of just general kind of mind awareness, psychological training for, you know, your business meetings and bits and bobs like that. But there's also a very good section on visualization. So there's different techniques that he lists and various ways of doing it. But use your time off the drop zone to do that. It doesn't take much to run through effectively a 30, 40 second skydive, because that's what it is, when you're stuck in traffic. Okay? But and you can also incorporate it into your pre-jump routine. Some people do a lot of visualization in the plane. I do a bit, but I'm just kind of preparing for that jump. 
by visualizing the jump that I want to do. And that's the most important. You focus on the jump that you are going to do. Not the, what am I going to do if this goes wrong? What am I going to do if that goes wrong? Focus on the jump that you're going to do. Happy? We're almost at the end, and then we'll have questions, and people will be far more. <laughs> Consistency. In competition, speed, this is the key. Doing the same thing each time, every time. Okay. Yeah, you can't control everything. You don't want to be so OCD that somebody that's sitting in a different slot in the plane messes you up or going to a plane with a, uh, a different door completely throws you. But having a routine of how you do things and how you do each jump is really important because I found it gives me bandwidth. I'm not thinking about doing anything new. Okay. My exit is the same every time. Okay. My setup in the plane, then the door is exactly the same. My pre-jump, deep breath in, relax, exit is exactly the same. Because that means when I exit the plane, I've got a clearer head. I don't have to be thinking about other stuff that's different, that's not quite right. Okay? I've done the same stuff. It's kind of boring, but it's the key to going faster, or one of the significant keys to going faster. Because that gives you more bandwidth to deal with the actual busy part of the skydive when it's going really, really fast and you're responding to those subtle changes in what's happening in the speed and your body. All right, Rob. Okay. And by all means, start off focusing on what you know you can do and then build up from there. Okay. Don't try to do too much new stuff at one time. It gets a bit difficult. But work on what you can do and build it up. And as you build up those acquired skills, they become second nature. There's things that two years ago, I was having to focus really hard on to be able to make a good speed jump. And I don't have to think about those things now because they become acquired skills. We can all ride a bike, well, most of us can, but we don't think about how we ride a bike. We just do because you've got that skill, okay? So in time, you build up skills, and the more skills you build up, they become second nature. You've then got more bandwidth to deal with the finer points, the little tuning that helps you go faster. You can't make yourself go fast. You do not have energy stored in your muscles like Usain Bolt that you are going to release for that extra spurt. Our kinetic energy in this speed skydive is created by dinosaurs and rainforests millions of years ago that compressed into solid, uh, sorry, to, uh, into oil and fossil fuels that got refined and put into that aircraft and took us to 13,000 feet to do the jump. So you have a set amount of kinetic energy. You can't release more than that. What you have to do is allow the speed to happen, okay? You're facilitating that. You can't make yourself go faster. And as all the speed skydivers here said, if you try and make yourself go faster, you make yourself go slower. Okay, it's a mindset change rather than a physical change in anything you do, but understanding that you're releasing the speed, you're facilitating that speed to happen, I found makes a real difference to how I speed skydive. So yeah, you can't make yourself go fast. You let it happen. Okay, and this is the other one. Don't fly it. You're riding it. Control. You stick legs and arms out to control yourself, you're slowing yourself down because drag makes you slow. You want to have minimum drag. So you're riding a knife edge between control and instability. And that's kind of what makes speed skydiving really quite fun. Okay? Once you start to go really, really fast, you know that you're riding it. You're, not, you're riding that really, really steep airflow. If you've got your arms out, yeah, you're in control, but you ain't going fast. So to go fast, you need to relinquish control. Let it go. Control's overrated. Just go with the flow, man. No, seriously, let go of the control. To go faster, you need to lose control slightly and do that ride the knife edge between control and instability. Okay. We're a new discipline. Please experiment. Okay. There's lots of room out there for new things to develop, and we are all kind of working things out. What you've heard, I'm near the end now, what you've heard is my take on what I think makes me go faster. Some of it has been absorbed from other speed skydivers. Some of it has been absorbed with chats in the pub and batting ideas around and things like this. And some of it I've kind of worked out myself. That doesn't mean it's gospel. 
So there's the received wisdom, the available knowledge out there, but it's very easy for anybody in this room to go out there, speed skydive, and develop something new and some new understanding. You know? And it's the kind of thing where we sit around after jumps because we haven't got a video and we think, I think I did this, and I think that's what made it go faster on that jump. You know? Try new things and analyze the results. Just be careful about doing too much new stuff on one jump because then you don't know which bit of it made you faster or made you slower. Okay? But yeah, try new things. And try them for several jumps. Quite often, we're tempted to kind of rush things and go, well, I tried doing this and it didn't work. Is that because it doesn't work, or is that because you didn't do it well enough to make it work? Okay. And finally, there's one thought I want to leave you with. If everything feels like it's under control, you're just not going fast enough.